Our scripture reading this morning comes from Luke chapter 17, verse 33. It says this, Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. The scriptures are as relevant today as they were then. Well, it's my honor to introduce our speaker here today, Stephen K. Spear is his name. And uh, Steve leads the men's ministry. He leads a life group here as well. He's part of our staff. And man, it, a lot of you here have met Steve, and maybe you've walked through those doors, and Steve has greeted you, and, and he's a big reason why you're here. Steve is the real deal. He loves to reach out to people, check in, get their story, stuff like that, and that has manifested itself so much in life groups. Uh, Steve has about 150 kids up there about, right? Yeah, 151. So Kayla's like, I don't know, nine plus months pregnant? Are you pretty close to nine, I think? But uh, in fact, I was thinking I may be called upon last minute here, uh, just in case. But man, I love Steve. Steve is a great friend. Please welcome Steve Spear to the stage. Hi. Hello. Hello. Well, thank you, Dallas. That's actually really one of the hardest parts of every one of these messages is how I'm going to introduce myself. So thanks for taking that off my plate. Uh, when I agreed to this date, I did not know that I would be following both Ira and Buddy. And I was thinking about it, and that means one of two things. Either Dallas thinks very highly of me, or he's using me to lower the bar back down before he comes back. I think that's probably more likely. Um, so my task for today is to close out the journey of a disciple series. And I'm supposed to do that by just talking to you guys about my experience with reading the book. Who here, let's do a simple show of hands, who here has read or is reading the book, The Critical Journey? All right, we got a couple. Who here has not read and is not reading the book? That's not all the hands. Who here is not going to raise their hand for anything today? You will not become Pentecostal by raising your hands to answering a few questions. Um, so because of that, this is going to be a very different message for me. Normally, my messages have a lot of slides. I'm trying to exegete scripture and just kind of explain what the scriptures say. There's almost no scripture in today's message. It's just story time with Steve. And it's going to get uncomfortable for me, which means it's going to be uncomfortable for you, but we're going to get through it together, all right? Um, if you haven't read the book, I would recommend it. I'm going to give you two warnings first, and then I'm going to tell you why I think you should read it anyway. Warning number one, it's not an easy read. It's not a long book, but it's got a lot of like psychology terminology in it, and you have to be really introspective to get anything out of it. You have to be willing to take a hard look at yourself. The other reason is there's no audio book. You got to do it the old-fashioned way with the pages and the turning and the reading glasses. Some of you out here I know, you were like, well, that's it. That's not happening. And everyone who just laughed gave themselves away. You're all audiobookers. Uh, but the reason why I would recommend reading it anyway is because the structure of the book looks a little bit like this. When you get to a chapter on one of the stages, it starts off with sort of a description of what that stage looks like, the attributes and behaviors in that stage. And you start off feeling pretty good. You're like, hey, I can identify with some of this. Like, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm in that stage. Maybe I'm moving along. And then the next part of the chapter is, these are the things that people display when they're trapped in this stage. And then panic starts to set in. You're like, is this as far as I go? Is this? And then the next part of the chapter is, this is how people get out of those being trapped type predicaments. And then you can identify with some of that too. And as you're reading the book, you can kind of see how your story weaves its way through this book. And you can see how you've, you can attach personal stories to all of these stages as you're going through them. So I think it's definitely a good idea to read it and just uh, personalize it a little bit. I think you'll get more out of it than just these messages that we're giving up here. One thing that's really important that the book points out a lot, Buddy's pointed it out, Pastor Dallas has pointed it out too, these are not like achievements to unlock. The goal isn't just to get to stage six, right? This isn't like a, a railroad 
and when you leave one stage, you leave it behind, and you're just trying to get to the last one. It's really more like, uh, like if you started doing karate, right? You start with your white belt, and then you, you graduate to your yellow belt. You don't forget all of your white belt stuff. It becomes an accumulation of all of these things. So when you move from stage one, recognition of God, to belonging, stage two, you don't lose recognition of God. You still have that. And when you move from belonging to finding purpose, you don't lose your sense of belonging. We're adding on to it. All right, so there's no shortcuts. There's no trickery. You're just going to have to go through it the old-fashioned way. All right, so in order to talk about uh, my process through this book, I, uh, I decided to use an analogy. I like using a lot of analogies. I think uh, it's a good idea to use things that people understand to help them better understand the things they don't. And the analogy that I came up with for this one is food. Who here eats food? By a show of hands. Come on, guys. All right. So we're going to go with food. And we're going to start at the beginning, which means we're going to start at stage zero. Yeah, that's right. I made up a stage. Stage zero is everything that comes before stage one. And I've done the math. It checks out. Where's Mark Frangioni, our mathematician? The math works out. Stage zero is everything that comes before stage one. So I'm going to paint a scenario for you, and I'm pretty sure everybody's been here at some point in their life. But who here has uh, been in a situation where they've just been really irritated, really frustrated, kind of angry? You're being really short with people. You're not really sure why. And someone uh, you love or trust leans into you, and it's just like, hey, when was the last time you ate something? Right? You're hungry. You're angry. You're Hangry, man, we're going to get there, you guys. All right. You're hangry. They used to have these Snickers commercials where Joe Pesci was standing there just like chewing out like a teenage waitress, just like yelling at her. And there's a teenage boy sitting next to him, and he just kind of leans in and hands him the Snickers. And he takes a bite, and he instantly turned from Joe Pesci back into like a teenage boy. But Snickers hadn't even gotten to his stomach yet. It was just like you take the bite, and you're like, oh, that is what I needed. And it's because... We have a stomach. We have this space inside of us that we have to put food in constantly to feel satisfied or sustained. But spiritually, we have a space like that also, right here. And people try to fill this up with all kinds of stuff. They try to fill it with success and money and power and careers, sports, all kinds of things, hobbies. And no matter how successful they are at those things, they always say the same thing. When they get to the very tippity top, they say, if I just had this, I would be satisfied. And they always say the same thing. Just felt the same. Never satisfies. Because that space can only be filled by one thing, and that is God. And when you recognize that, you enter stage one. You have a recognition that I have a space inside of me that can only be filled by God. Now, if you have been in church your whole life, you might not remember the very first time that you experienced that recognition, that moment of awe. And if you're newer to Christ, maybe you can. Um, I can't remember my first time. I came a little bit later. I, I came to Christ at 17. But uh, I can see where God was sort of laying some, some foundation from a very young age. Uh, my grandmother was, on my dad's side, was the most loving Woman, I don't think I've ever seen her angry a day in her life. When I started dating Kayla, breadcrumbs started lining up where I just knew that God wanted me to marry her. And, uh, but that wasn't the first time I really had this moment of awe. So I'm going to tell you that story right now. The first time I really felt it was a few months after we got married. Uh, right after I got married, <laughs> this is not going to go well. I can tell already. Right after we got married, I, uh, I, I joined the military, and I went off to basic training. That was part of the plan. Uh, that was how I was going to provide for my new family. So I went off to basic training. This was in 2004, so we were just getting into the Iraq War. Everybody there knew as soon as you completed basic training, you were going to get deployed. So my primary goal was to learn as much as I can to maximize the chance that I was going to come back. 
all right? So I took it very seriously. And because I was taking it so seriously, the drill sergeants, they made me a student squad leader. They were like, hey, there's some other guys. They're struggling a little bit. We want you to make sure that they're getting to the right places, that they have the right equipment. And if they're struggling with something, we want you to teach them these things that we're teaching you. And if it didn't go well, we would get called into their, uh, their office and we would get yelled at because that's what drill sergeants do. But one day, they came in, they called me into the office, and as soon as I walked in there, they took their drill sergeant hats off, and I knew that this was going to be a very different conversation. They told me I had something called a Red Cross message, and if you... I'm not even getting to the hard part yet. Um, if you don't know anything about the military, a Red Cross message is when um, you're in training or you're in combat, you don't have access to phones or emails or anything like that, and there's been an emergency. And my Red Cross message was that my grandmother had died. So they started laying out, um, they started laying out all my options. Uh, man, this is going to be brutal. All right. So they started laying out all my options. And they said, you know, you can probably go home for the weekend, but if you miss any days of, like, real training, you're going to have to recycle basic training. And that wasn't a big deal. I wasn't really having like a hard time with it. But the one question I had that I wanted answered was, well, what's going to happen to my guys? You know, I have made it a goal to make sure that they're going to make it home to their families too. What's going to happen to the guys that I'm helping train? And they were really taking it back because they were surprised that I cared about anybody else. But uh, when they said they had no idea, I kind of started to know that I probably wasn't going to go back. I was going to stay and, and tough it out with these guys. But I had to talk to my family first. So they gave me phone privileges, and I head downstairs to the phone, the phone bank. And uh, as I'm walking down, I start really preparing myself for what I knew was going to be a very difficult conversation. And that conversation was going to be that I was going to ask my newlywed wife to drive from Asheville to Florida by herself to be with my family while my grandmother was buried, because I wasn't going to make it. So I called her up, and she, uh, she answered. She said, hello. I immediately just started bawling. <laughs> I didn't say anything at all. I just cried. And she just kept saying, I know, I know, which was information. I didn't know how much time had passed between when I got the message and when she passed away. I didn't know if Kayla knew at all. So I gather myself, and I say, um, listen, I'm going to need you to drive down to Florida and be with my parents because I'm not going to make it. And she said, uh, I'm already there. She was already there. She was in my parents' house. She was meeting a woman named Anita, who was my grandmother's best friend, a woman I hadn't seen in 20 years. But in that moment, I knew that God was with me, that he had given me this woman to be my bride, that we were two that became one, and that with her there, it was just as good as me being there. Man, these transitions are going to be terrible. All right, so after stage one, <laughs> this is not going to get any better. After stage one, we quickly start moving into stage two and three. Uh, I'm going to bundle these together because I think one's an extension of the other. But once you start, you have this recognition of God, then you start gobbling up everything that you can find, right? You start praying, you start listening to worship music, you're going to Bible studies, you're going to services, maybe you join a life group. I call this the foodie stage. You're grabbing everything. You're trying a little bit of everything. And while you're trying all these things, you start to build this identity. You become an, you're becoming a Christian. You identify as a Christian. And in that identity, you find a sense of belonging, right? You belong to the Christian church as a whole, the global church. You, be you belong to your local church, your life group, your smaller group of friends. You identify with that identity, being Christian. And then the next natural extension off of that, things we keep trying, now you want to try some service, right? You feel like you want to grow closer to God. You want to feel like you're closer to this community, and you start serving, Maybe you start by helping out in the kids' barn or serving food on a Wednesday night or greeting people. Maybe you volunteer for the worship team or something like that. 
And in that service, we find purpose. Now we have belonging and purpose. Now, me personally, I didn't get to experience this until a little bit later. Uh, when I started going to church, uh, I was going to youth group with Kayla, and you know, I was 17, turning 18, and this youth group was pretty well formed at this point. They were all clicked up, and to be perfectly honest, some of the guys weren't exactly happy to see Kayla's new boyfriend taking up all of her time and energy. Uh, so I didn't get to experience this for the first time until I got to my first duty station. I went to uh, the 82nd Airborne Division, and when I got to my company, uh, I met two guys there. They were part of a group of guys called Navigators. If you haven't heard of Navigators, nav I got people nodding over here. You guys know about the Navigators? All right. So the Navigators are essentially an evangelism group whose mission field is the military, right? They prepare guys who are going into the military to evangelize to other soldiers in this process. And I had two of them in my company. They were from different places. Uh, one was named Private Ward, and one was Lieutenant John R. Dennison. I hung out with Private Ward a lot in the beginning, because I was also a private, but he ended up going to another company. And then once I went on my first deployment, I really started hanging out with Lieutenant Dennison. There was a relatively small group of guys who decided that we were going to take any off time we had on this deployment to do two things, go to the gym and go to the chapel. And we were there like five days a week just doing Bible study, worship nights, just being there for each other. And it was the first real time that I felt belonging. And then we would start to challenge each other. Hey, go invite your roommate. Hey, go invite your platoon sergeant. You know, let's... Uh, let's see if we can make this thing grow. And that started to give me a sense of purpose. Then on November 15, 2006, um, we were driving on a canal, going to see some imams or a sheikh or something like that. And uh, our convoy received small arms fire, bullets bouncing off our armored vehicles. Now, I was the first sergeant driver at this point so I was always in the very last truck, and the leader of the convoy was always in the very first truck. So Dennison was in the very first truck, I was all the way in the back. So the first couple trucks dismount, and they go to engage these guys that were shooting at us. And uh, after a few volleys of gunfire, I hear somebody come over the radio and say, call a medevac, Dennison's been hit. At the time, to be perfectly honest, um, Adrenaline was pumping. I didn't really think much of it. Medevac came. Medic said he was breathing when they left. Everything seemed okay. That night, we got reinforcements. The following day, we conducted an ambush on these tunnels that these guys were hiding out in, and uh, our XO was also wounded, Captain Schiller. Medevac comes in, takes him away. And then we go on this, uh, like, 10-hour drive to get back to the base. It was brutal. Everyone was exhausted. I was hallucinating, fall asleep, falling asleep at the wheel. We get back, and everybody's heading into their bunks to just crash. Now, because I was the first sergeant's driver, I was actually bunked up in the headquarters uh, building, not with the rest of my, my company. So I walk in the headquarters building, and there's another first sergeant walking by. And I say, what happened to Schiller and Dennison? And he put his hand on my shoulder and said, they didn't make it, and kept walking. I was frozen for a good 30 seconds. I didn't say or do anything. Then I walked to the end of the hallway and dropped my gear in my room and just started crying. And while I was crying, someone came into the room behind me, turned me around and grabbed me so tight. He was crying too. And it was Denison's platoon sergeant. After about two minutes of crying, not even reading this, I just can't look at you guys while I'm crying. <laughs> um, after about two minutes of crying, he uh, straightened me out, patted me on the chest, and walked out without saying anything. And I think it's fair to say I was confused. I wasn't really confused that Dennison was dead. We had talked about that a lot. That possibility was always there. But my sense of belonging, my sense of purpose was now shaken. 
What did this mean for our group? Who was going to continue to give me guidance? Who, who am I going to look to in this incident? He was going to be the guy that I was going to go to. And I don't want to talk about stage four too much because we've talked about it a lot. But I do want to work the food analogy in here. So at this point in the food analogy, one of three things is happening. Either A, you've reached for something and you've eaten something that doesn't sit well with you. These are the type of people who go through deconstruction. They've eaten something, their body rejects it, and they just don't know how to deal with it. The next thing is you've stuffed yourself so much that you just can't eat anything else. That's burnout. The last thing is you've just decided that I'm not going to continue to eat. I've gotten sort of bored with it. I'm just going to keep nibbling just to kind of stay in the game, stay alive. And that's lukewarm or getting stuck in stage three. And that's where I found myself at that point, just not doing anything. All right. Now, two things happen that help get me moving again. Now, listen. You guys got to hear me out, all right? You got to listen to the whole thing. Don't start sending letters to Pastor Dallas and the elders until you get to the end, all right? Just hear me out here. Two things happened. The first thing was Denison's platoon sergeant came back to me, and he had Denison's laptop with him. This was a really common thing to do. We, before we send anything back to the next of kin, we had to make sure that there was no operational security stuff in their belongings. So he was going through just making sure that there wasn't anything secret or sensitive on there. And he came across a file on his desktop. And the file didn't even have a name. It was just like a, a random series of numbers and letters. So he opens up the file. And again, just symbols and numbers and letters. It's an encrypted file. None of it makes any sense. Then he scrolls all the way to the bottom. And at the very bottom of the file, there are two words in perfect English. It says, John home. And I can tell you, me and that platoon sergeant had a really interesting conversation after that. I'm not going to tell you what that was now. If you want to ask me later, we can talk about it. But uh, let's just say we were both pretty shook up. The next thing was a few days later, we were getting ready to go on the first convoy that we had been on since the incident. And as I said, I was the first sergeant driver, so part of my job was to make sure the truck was ready to go. I had to make sure it had fuel, check the tire pressures, make sure the radio is working. And then there was this thing that we had called an FBCB2, a Blue Force Tracker. It was basically like a computer that had Google Maps on it, and it had a little pin for every truck connected to the network. All right? And you can click on them and send messages to each other. Now, obviously, we don't use each other's names when we're sending messages like this. We all have call signs. My call sign was Charlie 7 Romeo. I was in Charlie Company, 7 is the first sergeant, and Romeo means you're not talking to the actual Charlie 7, you're talking to his radio operator. Denison's call sign was Red 6. He was in Red Platoon, and he was the platoon leader, so he was the 6. So I boot this FBCB2 up, and I get a text message, and it says, Charlie 7 Romeo, this is Red 6, radio check. And I was floored. I was shooken. Now listen, I understand that there's a perfectly logical, technical explanation for what I just said, right? The file was on his desktop before he died. He probably sent the text message, and it was bouncing around in satellites, waiting for me to turn the truck on. If you're looking for supernatural origins for these messages, you're missing the point. The point is, God was with me in this moment. Just like laying down the foundation of marrying my wife before my grandmother died, those files, those text messages were laid in the foundation to help me get moving again. In Psalm 23, David says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. It doesn't say, hey, it's only green pastures and mountaintops for me. No, it says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. Now, it's important to point out that um, 
God didn't just take me out of stage four, pluck me out, and drop me right into stage five. As a matter of fact, I did what almost every other soldier does in this situation. I bottled it up. I bottled it up for the rest of that deployment. I bottled it up for my next deployment. And it wasn't until many years later that when I finally realized that I was getting out of the Army and that I wasn't going to get deployed again, I let my guard down and the symptoms of PTSD finally started to manifest. And it took me months of multi-times-a-week therapy to relive all of that mess and learn what it all means, what it means for me, and how I can move forward. All right, let's move on to stage five. Expert transition. Listen, stay, the reason, I actually did have better transitions. Uh, this one, I literally just wrote expert transition. Um, the reason why I don't have a great transition for stage five is this was the most difficult chapter for me. Stage six seemed like a fan, it seems like fantasy land. Like that's so far, like that's, that would be nice to have one day, but I'm not even concerned about that right now. Stage five was really difficult. And here's why. When I started reading it, stage five is surrender. That's easy. I'm surrendered, right? How many of you in here feel like you're surrendered? You don't have to raise your hand for this one. How many of you in here feel like you're surrendered? If God asked you to do something, you'd do it, right? But then I started to read more and more, and I started to think about people that I really looked up to. And I remember thinking, man, one day I hope to be as surrendered as those people. And if there's more room for me to surrender to get to that point, am I really fully surrendered? And I talked to Pastor Dallas and I talked to Justin about this a couple times. What does full surrender even look like? Imagine this for a minute. Imagine, think about you five, 10, or 20 years ago, if you're old enough. And think about you then. Would you have thought that you were surrendered at the time? I bet a lot of you might say yes. But now, when you look back, how many of you are thinking, man, they never knew what was coming. They never even knew what they were going to have to give up. Now think about you 10 years from now. Are they going to look back on the you of now and think the same thing? So what is true surrender? So then I was rereading the chapter and uh, one single sentence wrecked me. And I'm going to read it for you right now. It's short, but I'm telling you right now, if you fancy yourself a stage fiver, get ready. This one's going to hurt. One simple sentence. We do not burn out in this stage. We do not burn out in this stage. How many of you in the past six months, have said, I have no more room on my plate. I've got, I, I can take nothing else on. I have too much. That's burnout. I listen to a, uh, a leadership podcast all the time, and famous pastors, it's a big concern. That's all they talk about, how to avoid burnout. So then I was thinking about how to work stage five into this food analogy, and uh, I had a bit of an epiphany. So I want you to use your imaginations with me. I want you to picture that space that's only for God, and I want you to picture it as a plate on the table in front of you. And on that plate, you've got a big old helping of your career. You've got a helping of your family and friends. You've got a dollop of hobbies, and then you have this space over here carved out. That's for God. He gets your Sundays and your Wednesdays. He gets some prayer time in the morning, maybe a life group every other week. But then he starts to ask for more, right? Tear down, set up. Maybe you got the volunteer, the worship team. Maybe he wants you to lead a life group, and those things start to fill that plate up, and now your plate is full and there's no more room. But the problem 
isn't what God is asking you to do. The problem is what you've refused to take off your plate. True surrender is clearing the plate off, handing it to him and saying, you get to pick what I do. I'll take whatever's left over. You get first picks. I'm not making room for you. You're making room for me. That's what true surrender looks like. Worship team, you guys can start coming back up. Luke 17, 33. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life will preserve it. What parts of your life are you still trying to keep? The worship team is going to do a song right now. It's called Look Around. And here's the challenge to every one of us. Take a minute at the beginning to just appreciate that we're anywhere on this spectrum of stages. The fact that we're in his house alone is a blessing we don't deserve. No matter what stage you're in, praise him. But then I want you to take a good, hard look at that plate. And don't think about how you can make room to fit more of God in. I want you to take a look at the things that you've refused to give up. The altars will be open. You can sit there right in your seat, but what I want you to do is I want you to imagine scraping those things off of your plate and handing it over to them. We're going to scrape it right off at the feet of, feet of Jesus, and we're going to leave those things behind forever. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful for the awe and recognition of you that you have given us. We're so blessed to feel belonging and purpose in your house. We're so thankful that you are with us in the darkest valleys. Just like Buddy said, can't go over it, can't go under it, you gotta go through it. And Lord, I pray now that you will give us the strength to surrender to you. That you will show us what we have refused to give up. And you'll give us the strength to scrape those off and hand that plate over to you today. Be here with us in Jesus' name. Amen.